Heavenly Father, we know that your Son is coming at a day and an hour that we do not expect to judge all the world in righteousness. We know that for our sins we deserve only your wrath and punishment. But we flee to Jesus Christ, our Savior, whom you sent first before coming as a judge to be our Savior and Redeemer. We ask that through his gospel word this morning, you would continue to strengthen the faith which you have planted in our hearts, to keep our hearts focused and hoping for that day when you will come again to deliver us out of this evil world and bring us to yourself in heaven, and that by this faith and hope, we might be built up every day through all the troubles that we might face to grow in works of love and an appreciation for your word and for those who bring it to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn, which is a children's hymn again this weekend, which we actually fully printed in the bulletin, as I realized that I failed to do last week. It does not fit on one page. It's hymn 656, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
The order of service this morning is Divine Service Setting 3 in the Lutheran Service Book. It begins on page 3 in your bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I am the poor miserable sinner. Confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll continue with the intro. In keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. O Lord, make me know my end, and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears, for I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers.
Eternal God, merciful Father, you have appointed your Son as judge of the living and the dead. Enable us to wait for the day of his return with our eyes fixed on the kingdom prepared for your own from the foundation of the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading is from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. As I looked... Thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. This is the word of the Lord. We'll read Psalm 90 responsibly. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust. And to save and return all children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past. Or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are restrained. You have set our iniquities before you. Our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are seventy, or even by reason of strength, eighty. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger? And your wrath according to the fear of you. So teach us to number our days. That we may have a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. That we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. And for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants. And your glorious power to your children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Our epistle reading is from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Mm -hmm. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for our helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, 
but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Please rise for the gospel reading. Alleluia. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last the beginning and the end. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the gospel of the Lord. Confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 508 in the Lutheran service book. The day is surely drawing near. I know that there is one more verse on the next page.
Let us pray. O Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. Dearly beloved, saved only by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. What a day that will be. When suddenly out of the clear blue sky, the air splitting with the sound of trumpets, ascends Jesus Christ as God and Lord and King. What a day that will be. A day of endings and beginnings. A day when all things will find their end in Jesus, who is the beginning and the end. And so in him, all true things will find their final beginning. A day when all will be gathered, all secrets revealed, all questions answered, all debts settled, and all wrongs righted. The day that the Lord has been planning for, preparing for, since before the world began. The single day that our faith sets its sights on. And it's a day which no one and nothing will spoil. You know, so many days that are long waited for and long planned for don't always turn out the way that people are expecting. Things go wrong. Things get moved down the road. Things get messed up. Not this day. Because this day is entirely under the power of Jesus Christ. It is completely under him and in him and through him and for him and about him. Judgment Day is Jesus' day. It is the day of his glory, the day of his justice, and the day of his joy. Yes, what a day that will be. And what a Jesus. How different he will appear from the tiny babe who first showed his face in Bethlehem. He who cried with that small voice will come down from heaven with a voice like the thundering of many waters. He who lay in a poor manger will sit on heaven's glorious throne. He whose birth was announced only to a few poor shepherds in a field will gather before him every single person that has ever lived, and every eye will see him. He who came once in humility to die will now sit as the one who was dead, but behold, lives forevermore. He will come in glorious power, all authority in heaven and on earth given to him, and no one will be able to stand before him. No heart will be able to deny him. No knee will remain unbent and no tongue will help but to confess Jesus Christ is Lord and God. He will come down on clouds of heaven, flanked by a glorious vanguard of bright angels, as Moses wrote. Yahweh came from Sinai, and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand there was flashing lightning. These angels will gather before him all nations, and then every mouth will be stopped. There won't be any complaining, any resisting, any doubting or skepticism anymore. He will not come to bow his head to humility and suffering and grave. He does not come in patience to allow any evil any longer, or to let his name be disgraced or mocked anymore. He will come in overwhelming glory. For this is his day, the day of his glory and his vindication. You see how clearly this is laid before us in our text? You know, sometimes people call this the parable of the sheep and the goats. This is not a parable. There is only one brief illustration in the entire thing about separating the people, the way the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Everything else is clear and plain. It's not symbolism. It's not a guess. A lot of people try to guess about what that will be like. Not just about 
you know, the last day of the world, more often people make all these guesses about what will happen after we die and what the afterlife will be like. Notice, though, that that's not what Christ is focusing our sights on here. The scriptures do not teach us to set our hope on what will happen in the time between we're dead and Jesus comes again, but constantly to set our hopes and hearts on that great day, that day of Jesus' glory, the day that God has been planning for, the day that Christ has been reigning for, the day which God has placed into his hands, when Christ, in glory, will judge with justice and righteousness. He'll judge with the king's justice. I was reading a book not long ago. It's a fantasy fiction novel, and this country that they are in, there's a nobleman who um, has been accused of rape and murder. And there's all kinds of evidence against him. I mean, he's guilty as sin. He appeals for the king's justice. See, all the noblemen of that country had the right to appeal to have their case heard before the king himself. And he's hoping that this means he'll get off. Maybe the king will kind of like him because he's a nobleman too. Or maybe the other nobles will pressure the king. He's hoping that politics will get involved and so he'll get away with it. He's hoping that by appealing for the king's justice, he'll get a miscarriage of justice. That is not what happens. The king hangs him for his crimes. That's justice. The king's justice. The justice of vengeance. And indeed, that is one type of justice that we see in this text about what will happen on that day. As he says to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's not the only kind of justice that our text shows. There is also that justice of his blessing to the righteous and the reward of eternal life. To every one of you will come from the judge's mouth either that blessing or that cursing. And so obviously, we need to know on what basis he will make this distinction. How will the judge judge? People have a lot of ideas and guesses about that, too. You know, I was watching this show recently called The Good Place. I mentioned it, I think, in Bible study last week. Kind of an interesting show, pretty funny, and uh, takes an interesting look at different ideas about philosophy that people have had. And of course, human philosophy is always wrong, but it's interesting to look at it and see what people think about things like this. And the main idea of the show is, you know, how, how do people get to, to heaven? And of course, it's all based on different forms of work righteousness, because that's what people always come up with, nothing new. So it turns out in this show that they find out, well, according to the show, right, every deed on earth, they say, has this net positive or negative value, good or bad. And you add it all up. Now, this is an idea that a lot of cultures and religions have. I think there's this old Egyptian story about when you die, all your good news and bad news are added up on a scale, and then they're weighed against a feather. Something like that. Kind of weird. Well, in this show, it's quite a bit harder than that. It's not just you have to have done more good than bad, but you have to have done way more good. In fact, according to this show, you have to have a point score so high that you're one of the best people that ever lived. Well... Over the course of the show, the characters find out that this, that this bar is so high that no one has made it to the good place in hundreds of years. And they say, well, this isn't right. This isn't fair. It can't be such, such a difficult thing. And so they come up with their own idea. They say, it should just be about getting better. As long as you get better every day, they say, then that, that should be enough. It's a typical human way of looking at law and judgment Right, if I can't reach the bar, we, we better be up below the bar. Well, that's not how this judge is going to judge. I, I was thinking about that show and about this text this week, and I saw an interview with John Mulaney, he's a comedian, and he was talking to Seth Meyers about what he wants people to say about him at his funeral. You know how funerals usually go. They, they just say a whole bunch of of things, at least the ones on TV, they say a whole bunch of just really nice things about the person who died. You know, as good as we are at saying nasty things about people while they're alive, and about putting the worst constructs on everything they do, when they die, you know, we figure out how to say only a few nice things and, and ignore all the bad stuff and assume the best about them. 
And so he's saying, I don't want that. I don't want people to get up and they're saying, oh, he was such a nice person. He was always thinking about other people. Because everybody will know it's not true. He says, I wish somebody would just be up and say, yeah, but sometimes he could be a little princess. Is that what Jesus is doing in our text? I'm thinking about this interview. I'm thinking about this show. And I'm thinking about this text. And you know how a lot of people, when they think about this text, they imagine that it's teaching work righteousness. Well, look, he talks about all these good things that the, the righteous do and these bad things that the, 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 uh, the cursed ones do. And I thought, does this sound like real life? Does, you read that description of the righteous. Does that sound like your life? In our Old Testament reading, these books were mentioned, right? That on the last day, this book is going to be opened in which is written everything you've ever done. And if you just take any day out of your life and you look at the things that, that were done on that day, is this how it's going to read? Fed the poor, gave water to the thirsty, clothed the naked, visited the sick, and those in prison, welcomed the stranger. Is every single thing going to be like that and nothing bad? I mean, that's what he says about the righteous. There's not a bad thing about them. And then on the other side, he doesn't have a single good thing to say about the other people, as if they never did anything nice for anyone ever. Is that a standard anyone can measure up to? Or are we too often selfish little princesses who ignore the needs of others and the commands of our Lord? Can we say we've even done as much for the poor and the sick and the suffering as some people out there in the world who don't even confess to be Christians? Of course not. Is Jesus really saying here that he's going to judge the world on the basis of this. How much good we've done. More than whether we've been perfect. Of course not. And I'll tell you three reasons why. First, that would mean no one would go to heaven. No one. Because no one is perfect. The Bible itself says this. There is no one who is righteous. So who are these righteous? We had it in, in, in our other readings as well. In Psalm 90, Moses is praying and he prays about how terrifying it is for our secret sins to be set in the light of God's presence. No one is righteous. No one can measure up to that perfect record. And yet, the Bible also teaches us that there will be people in heaven. A great multitude, Revelation says, that no one can number. So what's going on? Well, well secondly... Second reason why we know he's not talking about judging on the basis of works is that that would be a direct contradiction to everything else that Jesus says about the question. His entire ministry, he's been saying the opposite. All these parables we've been looking at recently, the parable of the unjust judge, all of these parables, sorry, not the unjust judge, the, the uh, wicked tenants, all these ones that we've been looking at, emphasizing that it's by grace alone, throw them right out is what Jesus would be doing. And the third reason, the most important one for our purposes this morning, is that that is Totally not what this text is saying. You only think that if you only take a brief glance. Let's look at it a little bit closer. First, look at what Jesus says to the two groups. Come, you blessed ones, blessed of my Father, depart from me, you cursed ones. Both of those words, the blessed ones and the cursed ones, they're what are called perfect passive participles in Greek, which means that they refer to something that has been done in the past, and has an abiding result. In other words, he's saying the reason for that wonderful word that he'll speak to those on his right, come, is that they have been blessed. And the reason for that terrible word, depart, is that they have been cursed. But by who? Well, in the case of the blessed ones, it says, come you blessed of my father. And this is a major part of Jesus' ongoing teaching. Think about how many times he talks about this. Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, and Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus prayed, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to babes. And he speaks to the disciples, and he says, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For I tell you, many prophets and kings and wise men long to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. And he's talking about the gospel. As he said in Luke, Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. They are blessed. 
who hear and believe Jesus' word. They are blessed because it is given to them to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, because the Father reveals it to you. It is the Father's blessing, which is the reason for your faith, and it is that faith which is the reason for that blessed word from Jesus. Come. Now, the ne- look at how the next phrase drives this point home. He says, come you blessed of my Father, inherit. You don't earn an inheritance, you know. An inheritance is what you get when your parents die because you're their child. An inheritance as a Christian is what you get from the Father because Jesus died for you. What does Paul say? Through faith, you are all sons of God. Through faith in Christ Jesus. Sons of God, heirs, your sons and daughters of the king. And therefore, you are in line to inherit his kingdom and his glory. Not by works. What does the next phrase say? Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Notice that. Before the world began, this was prepared for you. That's talking about the doctrine of election, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. That God chose you, blessed you, before you were ever born, before you'd ever done anything good or bad, before you could possibly have earned anything, and decided to save you, to give this to you. That means that your salvation is entirely based on him, because he did it before you were ever born. Well, what about the other group, the cursed ones? What he says, depart from me, you cursed ones. Well, cursed by whom? Obviously, it's God. There's no one else who could do that. What did Jesus say once? He said, don't fear those who can kill the body. Rather, fear him who can kill both soul and body in hell. That's not the devil. The devil does not send people to hell. The devil gets sent to hell. God curses people with eternal damnation. But by not saying, depart from me, you cursed ones of my father, Jesus is highlighting something for us. And that is, you know, in this, in this text where both of these two speeches, the king makes those to his right and those to his left are so parallel, our attention is drawn to differences. So he says, blessed are my father, and then he says, cursed. Because he wants to emphasize that even though it is God who does the cursing, it is not what God wanted for them. It doesn't say, curse of my father, and it doesn't say, go to the eternal fire prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What does it say? Prepared for the devil and his angels. In other words, this place of torment was never intended for any humans. God intended it to bring vengeance on the devil and his demons, but on no one else. The curse that he pronounces, which will cause those who do not believe to go to hell was never what he wanted for them. He didn't prepare before the foundation of the world. His blessing is the reason for your faith. But his cursing of those who do not believe is a response to something. It's a response to their unbelief. And now we get the evidence for it. I mean, he's a judge, right? So there should be evidence entered in here in the court. And that's exactly what this next section does. When he talks about, I was hungry and you fed me, I was naked and you clothed me, or on the other side, I was hungry and you did not feed me, he introduces those two lists with the word for. Now, a lot of people, for some reason, seem to read this text and assume that the word for is actually not the word for, but is rather the word because. Anytime somebody suggests that he's teaching work righteousness here, that's what they're doing. They're trying to change the word. It is not the word because. In Greek, The word that is used is the word gar. And there's another word, hati. Hati means because. If you're going to say, this happened because of this. If Jesus was saying, you guys are going to go to heaven because of the good things you did, he would have said hati, because. He doesn't. The word gar can be used, as it is being used here, and I love this this phrase, as an evidentiary gar. That's the technical term. Meaning, it introduces evidence. He's saying, here's my judgment. These are the two judgments the king will pass. This blessing to the righteous and this cursing to the others. Why? Well, he's going to give evidence. He's going to give evidence of the blessing and the cursing. In other words, what he's going to do is he's going to give evidence of faith or unbelief. 
Now, you could stop at the most basic level here and say, well, good works are a sign of faith, and the lack of good works are a sign of unbelief, and that's true. But there's more going on here. Because there's another thing that people do with this text. I don't know how many times you guys have heard this. I've heard it all the time. Often people will say, use this text and this phrase as often as you did it to the least of these. To say that Jesus is teaching us how we or how the government ought to help the poor. It's not about that. But Jesus, don't get me wrong, Jesus certainly teaches us to help the poor and the suffering. He doesn't have anything to say about what the government should do, but he has a whole lot to say about what you should do. But that's not what he's saying here. Because people seem to skip this word. He says, as often as you did it to the least of these, and first of all, that demonstrative pronoun, these, means that Jesus the judge is pointing. There's, some, there's a group of people like right there, and he's saying, these ones, as often as you did it to the least of these, my brothers. That means his disciples. That's the way Jesus always uses that word. Once uh, people came to Jesus and said, your mother and your brothers are here. And he said, who are my mother and my brothers? But those who do the will of my father. And on Easter morning, Jesus appeared to the women. And he said, go and tell my brothers. And then the disciples gather after Jesus ascends into heaven. And what do they keep calling themselves? They call themselves brothers, brethren. What did Paul call the believers there in Thessalonica? Brothers. Because we are brothers of Jesus Christ. He has made us sons of God. He came into our family being born as a child to become our brother so that through his death and resurrection, we might become his brothers, sons of God with him. Now, this means that what Jesus is really saying is that what matters here as evidence of faith or unbelief is not just what you did to anybody, but what you did to Christians or did not do to Christians, and in particular, to those who preach the gospel, because that's especially the emphasis of this phrase. What did Jesus send out his brothers, his apostles, to do? Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, the same all nations that are now gathered before him. What Jesus is teaching here is that people are going to be judged on the basis of how they reacted to those who preached the gospel. Remember when he said it again to the disciples? He sent them out to preach, and he said, Whoever hears you, hears me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. And who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. So when people are out preaching the gospel, the way that we react to them is an indication of faith or unbelief. If we cherish those who preach the word to us, if we take care of them, if we aid them, if we support them, if we comfort them, if we help them, it's because we cherish the gospel. If we do not, if they are rejected, scorned, ignored, or worse, persecuted, it's because their gospel message has been rejected. And notice how this follows along with some of the parables Jesus told before, about how he sent out his messengers, and those people took them and beat them and killed them. Jesus' vengeance is saying, when you did that to the people who I sent to you to preach the gospel, you were doing that to me. You were rejecting my grace and my word. And he doesn't just mean pastors here, by the way. Pastors, teachers, missionaries, Sunday school teachers, parents, brothers, sisters, strangers on the street, anyone who preaches the word to you, anyone who calls you to faith in the gospel of the forgiveness of sins, anyone who calls you to repent of your sins and believe in Jesus, that's what he's talking about. Our reaction to that shows faith or unbelief, and it is only faith in the gospel that is the basis on which Jesus will judge everyone. Those who are blessed are blessed because they trust in Jesus, not because of anything they did, but because of his grace. They inherit the kingdom because they, through him, are sons of God. You are called righteous, and not a single thing will be mentioned of your sins on that day. Not because you never committed any, not because he's ignoring them or whitewashing them, as if it's a funeral and he just doesn't want to say anything mean. This won't be a funeral. It'll be the opposite of that. Instead, he has Christ washed you in his own blood and holiness. You are forgiven. That is why you are righteous. That is why he has nothing but good things to say to you. And that is why you may hear that blessed word come. That's why you will enter into eternal life. 
Not because of who you are, but because of who Jesus is. Not because of what you have done, but because of what Jesus has done. Yes, Jesus will judge on the basis of grace. Grace that makes you righteous. Grace which makes you just in Jesus. And so, for those who do not trust in this grace, there will be only vengeance and curse and eternal punishment. Because judgment day is Jesus' day. The day of his justice. And his justice is all about him. How you respond to him. Without him, there is only eternal curse and damnation. But in Jesus, there is righteousness, forgiveness, grace, blessing. In Jesus, there is joy. I just want to talk about this to close briefly. We'll get more of this next week, because it's really the emphasis of the parable we'll look at next week. But this text can seem really scary. Jesus' words to those who are cursed are so harsh. They're so final and terrifying and damning, and we indeed should take them to heart. We should be terrified in our own tendency to reject the word, to ignore those and mistreat those who share it with us and to take it for granted. We should be terrified in our own judgmental self-righteousness. We're always trying to be the judge instead of God. But we can rejoice and take comfort in this text, in the grace of Jesus, and in the blessed joy that he will bring to his own. And to that end, just consider one more word. The word come. Jesus says, come. From Jesus, that is such a precious word. Come, follow me. Come, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Jesus is going to say to you, and he's saying to you right now through the gospel, come. It's time. Come away with me. Come away from this evil world. Come away from your sorrows and toils and pains. Come away from burdens. Come away from sin and death and pandemics and politics. Come away to my home. As he said in Song of Solomon, arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away with me, for winter is over and done. I will be with you, he says, and you will be with me. Come into my joy. That is what he will say to you who believe in him, who are blessed on that day. Yes, what a day it will be. A day that is all about Jesus. The day of Jesus' glory. The day of Jesus' justice. The day of Jesus' joy. Amen. Please rise. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. service book, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending.
So we'd be with you all here and sharing the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. I don't really have any announcements other than council meeting should be not this Tuesday, but oh no, would be this Tuesday. Yeah, but it doesn't actually matter. I told some of you. Uh, thank you to Michael for playing, and uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with each of you. Mm-hmm.